you're 30, 40 years old, and then you spend half of your life in prison, and then you just wake up and say, wow, that quick, you know, my life just changed. A typical day for me was um, trying to stay alive. You trapped in this cycle. This, and this, like I said earlier, it's very vicious, you know, and it's easy, and you can easily be sucked into it, especially when you are coming from these neighborhoods and you see nothing else but this. Now you're afraid of the police. Before, you know, the police were, were for you, you know, they will help you and, you know, what's, what's going on in our society? We're afraid to even call the cops. Most people never really spend time alone. Most people <clears throat> have distractions, cell phones, TV. They don't spend time alone. And the moment that you spend this time alone is where you find your truth. You know, you find out who you are. One thing I realized when you're walking in your truth, you are a mirror to certain people. People look at you and they realize their faults and they, where they fall short and they say, yeah, I can't measure up to this. People are eager to change their circumstances, but they're not willing to change themselves. Everybody always wants something, but nobody want to give. And that's what I want to do. I want to give. I want to help. Don't never, you know, feel like you have to put on a facade and be fake for people. It's important to live in your story. Be who you are and be the best version of yourself and be true. Be honest. This week on American Real, we continue with our Millennial Series and welcome Mike Pride, who after spending nearly a decade in prison, found his true identity, living in truth, by turning his passion of helping others into his destiny and creating Project X, a program to empower young men in order to lead them down the right path. The name is a tribute to one of his heroes, the legendary Malcolm X. He is committed to inspire young men to keep them off the streets to be a mentor and help connect them with positive role models in their community. His faith has helped him redefine the meaning of having a second chance as he beat all the odds, transforming his life, now giving of himself in his personal quest to feed and clothe those most in need. Mike Pride has opened my eyes to some significant issues facing our society today. Our conversation gets deep and emotional as we discuss topics such as the misunderstood Muslim faith, African America's fear of the police, and the importance of spending time alone in order to find your true self. And now, without further ado, I bring to you Mr. Mike Pride. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks, and today our guest is Mike Pride, founder of Project X. Uh, you're on a mission to clothe and feed the homeless, to empower men, to bring awareness and improve the lives of those suffering from mental illness, and to help lead young men down the right path. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roger. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, you have an incredible story. Uh, I can't wait uh, to get into it and you know, into the details. But I'd like to start off by saying uh, f for young men, 
there's no worse enemy than the streets. Absolutely. You agree with that? Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Tell us why. Um, coming from the neighborhood that I came from, um, that plays a big part because a lot of us didn't have father figures. We didn't have role models. Um, I remember times where I was in school and there was no judges, there was no lawyers. They say that you can be anything, but then you don't see these people in your community. And it's like, well, can I be these things? You know, <laughs> I have never seen a judge come to my school. You know, I've never seen a lawyer, or bl no disrespect, but black, you know, in our community. So um, I think the streets was like, it played a part of guidance to some men, you know. Um, like I said, most of us grew up with our mothers. Um, and we know that it's a liability to a son not to have his father. So um, that's where I feel like most men get sucked into. Because it's a facade, it's not real, you know? And as you get older, you realize <laughs> you're 30, 40 years old, and then you spend half of your life in prison, and you just wake up and say, wow, that quick, you know, my life just changed, you know? That quick in the time span, it's, you know, it's, it's not real, you know? so. I just want to show these young men that you can be a man. You know, you can you can be yourself. You can be you can live your passion. You can live your truth. And it's okay to cry. It's okay to be who you are. You know, you have to put on this macho image. It's not real. You know, listen to these rappers and you know the drug usage and it's it's just it's it's not conducive to of us as people. You know, it doesn't help us in any way, in no fashion. You know, so I tell men, you know, don't get caught up in the facade. You know, so the street life is not something that I would glorify. I lived it at one point. Um, I appreciated it at one point as well because it taught me valuable lessons. And it also sculptured me into the man that I am today. You know, so there you can change, you know. So. And is there pressure for the younger men uh, from th those a little bit mm -hmm. older to bring them in to that street life? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and does that play a big role Absolutely. in the decision? Absolutely. You, because yeah. those men are bringing these other men in was once those, was those men, you know, so it's a cycle and it's a vicious one, you know, and like I said, until we start acknowledging these issues in our community, they're only going to fester and grow, you know. These young men are growing up and they're becoming animals, you know, in a sense, because of the environment, which breeds that type of violence, you know, and um. Like I said, it goes overlooked. You know, what's going on in our communities where I've seen personally young men walk up to caskets and don't shed a tear? What's going on in our communities where, you know, a man gets sentenced to a life sentence and he doesn't shed one tear? What, what's going on in his head, you know, that he pulls out a gun and he murders another person? What's going on in our communities that we, our men are, you know, are suffering, are in pain, you know? And, it's, and I always tell people, especially women, you know, with these feminist groups, um, yeah, you can raise queens. You can raise a queen. You can raise her and teach her all these, these powerful things, which is, is important. But you also have to do the same for men because eventually she will have to lower her standards. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. And is that your mission? Definitely. To help young men? Definitely. Definitely. Because I see the need in our communities. You know, this is not a black or white thing. You know, this is a need in the community in general. You know, there's, there's men suffering. And I think it's, you know, we were always taught to, be macho. You crying, suck it up. You know, <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't do that, you know. But in all reality, what are you saying? That he's not supposed to feel? That he's not supposed to, because he's a man, he doesn't have emotion? That he's supposed to just cover it up and not cry? What, what's going on in our community that we, we feel like this towards our men? So that's why I feel like I come into play. I wanted to read one of your recent uh, Facebook okay. posts, if I may. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, you said, uh, it's a beautiful thing to see brothers change their lives around for the mm -hmm. better. Absolutely. I've led many men down the wrong path Absolutely. in life. It's an amazing feeling mm -hmm. to help guide them down the right path. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some detail around what, what you meant? Um, basically, <clears throat> when I say I guided men down the wrong path, meaning I, um, I wasn't the pillar of light that I am today. I was toxic, I was hurt, I was in pain, I was suffering, and so in, re in return, you know, hurt people hurt people. So I never really paid attention to 
the, the, you know, the effects that I had on people. Because people always gravitated towards me, especially young men. And I would always lead them the wrong way. You know, I've never gave them, you know, books and, you know, taught them how to raise their family and be, you know, productive citizens and get jobs and, you know, and help them. You know, help them because a lot of us, a lot of men, you know, that have spent time in prison, they come out and they don't know where to start. So recidivism rate is so high. So they go right back, you know. They don't have that person who said, you know, look, take, take time. I'm going to show you how to do it. This is what my organization is going to do. We're going to show you how to do this so you can stay home with your family. You know, I don't want I don't want to see men going back and forth to prison, you know. So um, not to lose the topic of what you what you asked. Um, to, for me, um, me changing my life it also helped other people change their life. So when I said that um, that statement, that was a day that a, a young man took. He became Islam. He came became Muslim um, because he seen me. You know, he was like, "Yo, brother, like I see what you're doing." You know, Project X, and my story is is very touching in a way. It's touching because a lot of people who know me, I'm not supposed to be here. So it's not like I'm super successful, but this story really doesn't happen. You know, and it, it, and a lot of men are gravitating towards me, and they're changing their lives by the dozens. I got a bunch of phone calls by men saying, look, I'm ready to change my life. I love what you're doing, brother. Please help me. They screaming, they reaching out, you know, and I'm here for you, you know. What a great feeling Thank that you. must be for you. Absolutely. So you, you led men down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. Now you're leading them down to the, the right, right path. path. Absolutely. And it seems like you're building mm -hmm. up almost a community Absolutely. around you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and what a wonderful thing. Powerful, powerful. Very powerful, very touching too. Because when I started Project X and I had the vision, I never thought that it would, I, would, I, I didn't think I would be sitting here with you, you know? I thought that when I told people, they thought it was stupid, they thought I was crazy, they thought it was funny, you know? And I was telling them, look, it's gonna be, st I'm gonna do this. And you know, it was just like, oh, you know, yeah, whatever. You said you was gonna do a whole bunch of stuff, you never did it, <laughs> you know? So now it's coming to fruition, and now people are saying, oh, wait, he might be on to something. Hold on, because I'm living my truth. I'm living my passion, I'm living my destiny. This is who I am. I'm not trying to be other than what I am, you know? So when you live in accordance with life, then you know you're gonna bless, God is gonna bless you. And that's how I feel, so. Who is Mike Pride? Wow. Very, it's very intricate. <laughs> um, uh, who is Mike Pride? The old Mike Pride or the new Mike Pride? Because <laughs> it's two different people. <laughs> Just how you are. I, I want to know who you are. All right. Well, I'm... Um, as a person. As a person, I'm, I live with morals and values, principles. Um, I'm a very compassionate person, obviously. You know, we, I, <laughs> feeding homes out my pocket. You know, I don't get no help from nobody. You know, this is something that God has obviously, you know, put good people in my life where we were able to come together and, you know, put this thing together and, and you know, see it happen. Um, I am a very lovable person. I feel like I, I, I got a big heart, you know, and sometimes people, they tend to, you know, manipulate you and use you in ways where it hurts you, you know, so I'm, I'm, easily, I'm easily hurt, you know, especially by friends and family, you know. Um, I'm a very... Conscious person? It took years for me to be very conscious. Um, I read a lot. <laughs> I, I read a lot, <laughs> like literally. I read a lot of books, um, just broad knowledge, you know, not just one you know, specific you know, teaching, but I read all around. Like I love Socrates, Aristotle, you know, um, big on Darwin. I'm big on all these, you know, these different theories, and you know, so I read a lot. And, um, and you, have, you, have you always been that way? No, no, no. I think finding myself Finding my identity is what allowed me to grow into this person and embracing myself and saying, you look, I'm not this street kind of guy. You know, I'm, <laughs> that was just a facade because I, I didn't want to be hurt. So I had to hurt other people, you know, so that's where it really came from. It, and then I started living in my truth where I sat down and one day I was just like, yo, this is not who I am. Why am I not being who I am? What's wrong with me that I can't be myself? You know, why am I suppressing all of this fire that I have inside of me and, you know, because of public opinion, because I'm afraid 
And that's what it really basically is. You're, you're fearful of what people are going to say. You know, oh, oh now you, you know, you do, you're this, you're that. You know, you think you're better. And it's like, no, I don't think I'm better. You know, that's that proverbial crab in a the bucket. They want to pull you down, you know, so. And do you feel, do you think most people that are on the street feel that way? That they, that they can't be themselves? Absolutely. Or, do you, or does it take time to, to, to figure that out? I think it's a little bit of both. I think time and time alone, most people have never really spent time alone. Most people <clears throat> have distractions, cell phones, TV. They don't spend time alone. And the moment that you spend this time alone is where you find your truth. You know, you find out who you are as a person. And I think society knows this. This is why, you know, they come out with all these phones and get all this, this nonsense is to distract you from reality. Because the moment that you start to, you know, sit down and really th understand your thoughts, as a man thinketh, so shall he. So you have to understand that your thoughts shape you into what you are, you know? So I don't think a lot of people understand that. I really don't. Talk about mm -hmm. what you do for the homeless. Well, it's, it's very touching, because I got... <laughs> I've, um, I've, um, I fed a lot of people, you know, and it's touching to me because the gratitude, you know, the love that these, these people have, I've never felt anything like it. You know, this, this is what, this, the cars, the, you know, the jury, all this stuff didn't matter at that time. You know, when I seen this little kid come in and he was hungry, you know, and we were able to feed this kid. And the type of compassion and love that I felt was like, I wish more people understood this. I wish more people reached out and they, you know, we were able to feed much more, much more people. You know, I'm doing it on a small scale, maybe three, four hundred people, which is, you know, I'm thankful for. But, you know, putting putting backpacks on on, on kids, you know, that's important in my community because most kids, you know, we we live in poverty community, you know, poverty restricted. So it's kind of hard for parents, single mothers, to buy backpacks and, you know, she got to buy school clothes and all this stuff, and it's it's expensive. And when I went back to my community and I opened up the trunk, I did it out of the trunk of my car. I was giving out backpacks, you know, and the, the, you know, the gratitude and the love from these people. It was like, because they, they remember me when I was this other person, you know. And it was like, wow, look at God. Look, if God is, God is real because look at you. You, was, you were a menace. You weren't supposed to be here. And now look at you. Now look at the kids looking up to you. You know, it, it touched me to, to hear people say, you're, you're inspiration to my life. You know, a homeless guy, he... Hope, you know, he grabbed me and just held me. He was like, yo, my brother, like, thank you. I was hungry. And I shed tears because I've never been homeless. I went, I went without meals, though, you know, being, you know, incarcerated. But um, the level of, for that moment, right, in that moment in time, I was connected to that man. I don't know his story. He don't know mine. But for that second, we were together as one. No matter if we were black or white. For that moment, we had unity because we agreed on one thing. We were human. You know what I'm saying? We were human. And I think that's what people really need to understand. You know? And why are you really doing it? I mean, what? Because it's... Look, I think a lot of people try to help the homeless. They may donate their clothes. Absolutely. Or they Absolutely. may give some money to help oh. feed them. But oh. you're actually in the trenches with mm -hmm. these people. You're yeah, on the street, yeah, handing them a coat, <laughs> yeah. a backpack, yeah, yeah. pouring them some soup. Absolutely. I guess my question is, mm -hmm. what clicked in your life to make that happen? And, mm -hmm. and then the second part of that, why aren't more people doing it? Um, I got to give credit to my mother. My mother, <laughs> she's going to laugh when she see this. <laughs> when I was younger, my mother brought a lady off the street to the house. <laughs> I said, Ma, <laughs> what are you doing? But my mother's heart is so, oh man, this is where I get it from. I get it from watching my mother, because she's the same way. She will give her coat off, the, off her back right now to anybody who's in need. You know, she's always been like that. So I guess watching her is what allowed me to be this person too, because I kind of like, I loved it. You know what I'm saying? I loved it once I started doing it. You know, um, like I said, I've, I've seen people donate it, but they've never went in the trenches. 
Like the people that you see me with, I came here with, you know, are the people that come in the trenches with me, you know? And I think that's important because anybody can just donate, you know, that means nothing. But it's a right. difference when you're connected. Now you're connected because I'm giving this to you hand in hand. Now we're connected on another level. You know, and then and it also shows the person who's receiving that there's compassion in the world, that there's still love, love and hope, you know, that you can, you know, there's people who still care, you know, because the world is so cold now, you know, and people really don't care. You know, they say they care, but they really don't care. They care about, you know, the uh, possessions of this world, but they don't care about other people. And that's important. We care about dogs more than we care about our people. And that's important. You know, how do we get more? people to think like you? Is it education? Um, is it leadership? What is it? Um, I think it's a level of consciousness. Just being aware of your surroundings. I think most people are not aware of their surroundings. You know? So they will walk past somebody who's in need. I can't do that. I don't have that type of heart. I've never had that type of heart where if I have money in my pocket and this man is hungry, I can just walk past them. What type of person are you if you're able, you can do that, you know? So for me, it was like, no, I will go in my pocket and I will give it to you here, you know? So I think it's a level of consciousness. Just like how people, you know, they go to the grocery store and they don't realize being conscious that it says organic, on just this little owl right here, it says organic, right? Which is real food. But what, are, what is the rest of this stuff in here? <laughs> If this is just, if this is real food, this little small owl is just real food, then what is the rest of this? It's garbage. It's not real. It's processed, you know, it's filled with all kinds of chemicals and people go through daily, you know, life and they don't really understand these things. And it's not, they don't, you're not conscious, you know, so. And again, as you talked about earlier, mm -hmm. it's, it's society driving us there, right? Absolutely, it's, absolutely. It's this matrix of, of, of absolutely. fake news, of absolutely. media, absolutely. of, um, and the moment mm -hmm. that, not to cut you off, but the moment that we break away from that is when that level of, that level of consciousness, consciousness kicks in, excuse me. Um, just being aware, you know, I've seen a video where, <clears throat> and this is another reason why, it, you know, I was like, I gotta do something. I've seen a video on, um, it was on Facebook, and um, this young man was homeless. He was out in the cold, it was freezing cold, and um, he had just a t-shirt on. People were walking past him, walking past him. He's shivering. He was on the brink of death, and he's just walking past him. And I seen a, a man stop and say, are you cold? Are you all right? And he says, I'm cold. I'm hungry. And the man takes off his jacket and gives it to him. He said, listen, you're going to be OK. This was another homeless man. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This was another homeless man. He said, look, I understand what you're going through. I'm homeless too. I was, and it brought tears to my eyes. I said, look, we gotta, we gotta, excuse me, we gotta do something. You know, we gotta, we gotta help out more. You know, so. And how do we do it, Mike? <sighs> By uniting, sitting down, coming together as one and addressing the issues in our communities. You know, it's, there's no way people should be starving. There's no way that, you know, kids should be out here with no coats on. You know, there's no way that you, ha you know, people out here with no food, you know, in a refrigerator. And there's people who have billions of dollars in the world, <laughs> you know, have all of this money, but you can't take it with you when you die. You know, I think having money is a tool to help other people, you know. What you, it's not what I, you know, what I have, it's what I can do for you. What can I do for you? Not saying that I can't, you know, help myself, but what can I do for you, you know? And that level of consciousness you talk about, the more people that have that, I think, will be able to help those more in need, right? But it is sad that at the point we are here in 2018, that we still have these mm -hmm. major problems, not only in the U.S., but yeah. worldwide. Worldwide, absolutely, worldwide. And yeah, some definitely, countries definitely, are, are, are definitely. devastated. And like you said, we have the money, we have the resources, um, but it doesn't seem to be the priority that it should be. Mm -hmm. I agree. Totally agree. Because if that homeless person in the U.S. or, you know, in Zimbabwe was our family member, <laughs> absolutely, we would do what we could Abs to help there them. There you go. There you go. Wow, that's deep. Absolutely. I agree. 
You're also on a mission to empower men. Mm -hmm. We talked about that a Absolutely. little bit. Yeah. Uh, tell us more. So tell us, mm -hmm. like, give us an example of what you do um, on a daily or weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Are you recruiting people? Are you reaching out? Or is it a combination of uh, it's a little people of finding both. you? It's a little bit of both. Um, I run a, um, a mentorship where I sit down with a bunch of young men and, you know, God them into the right way, you know. Um, so yeah, I, in a so, in a sort of a sense, yeah, I do I do both, you know. I look for people that can help, you know. So um, <clears throat> it works both ways. A lot of people reach out to me, just like we was talking about earlier. Uh, a young lady reached out to me about her son. She had two boys, two boys, and um, they on they were at risk. Very the high high risk. She reached out to me. I guess she found my information from somebody else, and um, we had a nice conversation. But the moment that I told her that I was, you know, what I, you know, I was part of Islam, she just, just stopped talking to me, you know. And I I just didn't understand that, you know, it played a, it kind of hurt me in a sense, you know. But um, why is that? Because uh, <clears throat> it's a big stigma around Islam that I wish people really got to understand. You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful religion, and it changed so many lives, and it helped me, you know. So when somebody just kind of like ostracized me because of this, it's like, oh, wow. You know, you don't even, you don't even understand it, you know. And you rather cut me off because of my religion than help you get your son some help? Like, what kind of thinking is that, you know? So I was a little hurt by that, but um, she did reach out to me. Um, I wasn't able to obviously mentor her, her sons, but I was able to help other men. And that's the, that's the goal, you know, the goal is to save as many we, as, as I could, or as we could, you know? Um, I think that's important. I think men need that guidance, that discipline, that, uh, that brotherly love especially in this world that we live in, it, you know, so it's, in, it's, in, it's imperative. Hope I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did. You did. And, and I'm just thinking more about uh, the need to empower young men. I just, mm -hmm. you know, we need more Mike Prides in this definitely, world. Definitely. I wish there were more. You know how many people I've reached out to? Like, bro, let's, let's sit down together. Let's have coffee. Let's, let's have a dialogue. Let's have a conversation where... You got experience, you know. <laughs> these bro these men need these. They need to hear these stories, you know. So I'm scheduled to go to a school. I think next month I'm going to speak in front of 300 class, 300 uh, students, young men. Um, it was powerful. The lady reached out to me and she was just like, "Yo, I love your story. I don't really know it, but I seen you on Facebook. I see all these great things you're doing, and I, these boys in my school they need they need to hear your story." So I was just like, "Wow!" I was blown away. I was like, "All right, let's do it. The schedule, you know." Um, and it was, it, was, it was touching to me because I was never this person. You know, I was the one who <laughs> the parents didn't want the kids around. <laughs> you know? right, right. I was the bad guy. Now I'm the inspiration. You see how that life can change that yes. quick. And it's just like, wow, I'm the inspiration now? I get all of these beautiful uh, messages every day. Somebody telling me, Yo, you inspired me. You inspired me to do this. My sister, she's out in North Carolina. She's, she's starting a Project X out there. So it's, it's starting to spread, you know, friends, you know, they, they starting to get on board now. And I think now people are starting to get it. Now, the more that I continue to be, to be consistent, now they understand and okay, he's on a mission, you know. That's awesome. Um, I want to talk just a little bit more about okay. street life. Okay. What it means and um, if you could go back and, okay. and just... Talk about what is the mindset? Okay. Because I think for the average person mm. like me, yeah. <laughs> you know, a white guy who, who, who doesn't yeah. have any exposure to mm -hmm. that, and many others who just aren't in that life, uh, you know, there, there's, again, we talked about the reasons why. We mm -hmm. talked about how these kids are pulled into pulled this into, life. Yeah, yeah. But when you're there, when you're in that moment, what, are you scared? Mm -hmm. Are you arrogant? Mm -hmm. Are you... Um, careless mm -hmm. are you uh, you know what's what's the mindset mm -hmm. what's the mission what, what, what what's someone on the street um, well when I when, 
when I was introduced, it was crime was born out of necessity. The, it was born out of the need, you know, the, the need to want, to want more. Some people just want to fit in. You know, they're they afraid to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you in an environment like I grew up in Brownsville section of Brooklyn, this is a bad neighborhood. You know, it's death all around. And you don't want to be that person. You know, you don't, we go to so many funerals, like I mentioned earlier, we go to so many funerals, out losing friends, and this is why you, 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 you arm yourself. It's not because you want to be a renegade and, you know, you want to be the super tough guy. No, it's that you are afraid. People are dying here. You know, it's a, I wish I can show you, you know. It's, so when you, when you become numb because you went to so many funerals, that's a problem. You've seen more people die than go to college. That's a problem. You know, this is, this is issues that, that, you know, and so other men influence other men, especially if they never had a father, right? Right. So what happens is you have young men who look up to these drug dealers who glorify this life and I'm getting money and they have everything that you want, <laughs> you know, the American dream, supposedly, but they're doing it the wrong way. And it's kind of like a... It's kind of romantic in a way, you know, it's fantasized and cause, because we were never taught, honestly, like this is the wrong way. You know, like I said, if they had, they were judges and right. the prominent people who came from this community came back and said, look, you can be this. Look at me. That's the prime example. So is the mindset this is the only way? I mean, is it, do, do kids For think, most people, yeah. I don't have much choice here. For most people, yeah. For, especially there in those communities, yeah. That's, they, yeah. that's how they feel. They feel like either I'm going to die here or... This is the only way here, is to sell you know, Trapped. Yeah, you trapped in this cycle. This, and it's, like I said earlier, it's very vicious, you know, and it's easy, and you can easily be sucked into it, especially when you are coming from these neighborhoods and you see nothing else but this, you know? You see nothing else. You come out your building and it's just, it's death, you know, and, they, and these, these people are suffering, you know? There's no aspirations, there's no goals, there's nothing really there, you know? But what were you thinking day to day back then? Like, what was a typical day for you? <laughs> a typical day for me was um, trying to stay alive. Really? Really. Trying to stay alive. Doing Are you anything. sleeping with one eye open? That too. Because, you know, as you're sleeping, you, you, you're hearing gunshots and it's waking you up out your sleep. You know, I've seen people, you know, young too, you know, lose their lives to the streets. And that's like, for what? You, you serve so much more to this world, but you get sucked into this, this life and you, you, you die at a young age, you know, and my heart bleeds for these people because I was one of them, you know, and they are trapped. And the more that you, you try to help them, the more that they pull back because they don't, it's, it's a fear, you know. So what, what would happen in a typical day? A typical day is, um, what, in that environment? Yeah, take us back to when you were in uh, that environment. <clears throat> I mean, is this gang life? Is this? Um, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both gang life, uh, street life, all of, all of it, mm -hmm. is, they're all together. You know, um, a typical day is, obviously, you're not employed, so you're getting up a little, you late, you know, and you're just, just breezing through life, just going through life and with no purpose, no goals, no nothing. You know, you're selling drugs and, you know, if it comes down to it, you will hurt somebody. Not because you're an animal, it's because you, 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 have to, you have to survive, you know, and it's, and it's in, in this jungle. And when you say hurt somebody to get something to get? Whatever you have to do. But tell us about that. What does that mean? Tell, give us some examples. Because honestly, people don't know about this. Yeah. I, want people to, <laughs> okay. I want people to know. Um, as far as hurting people, um, <clears throat> it's more of a reputation thing, too. Because you, you want your name to reach out so people won't bother you, which is, you know, a part of fear. You know, you want to hear, oh, such and such. Oh, don't mess with him. Don't mess with <laughs> him. <laughs> he, he is crazy. Mm -hmm. So then you start to, when people start calling you crazy and all these, now it's a psychological thing. You know, even if you're really not, mm -hmm. now you, you have to put on this image now. When this you're really facade. not. This facade. This yeah, facade. Right. You know, you have to come out the house and you have to be this macho tough guy and, you know, by, then you hurt somebody. And then now you're off to, you know, prison. And do you feel bad when you hurt somebody? I think the first time you do. I think after that, you become numb. Just like 
any other, you know, any other situation that you do, re you know, repeatedly. Eventually, you don't feel nothing. So you lose that human. You lose that. You lose touch. that, and it becomes animalistic, you know. And especially in in, in those environments, yeah, of course, of course, I've seen people hurt people, you know, and and not think about it. It was just like off impulse because I'm not gonna let you hurt me. I have to protect myself, and I'm afraid. Most m people in these communities are afraid. They don't want to die. We see all our friends die. We see all our friends get held, you know, to, to federal penitentiaries for the rest of their lives and not shed a tear. And that's sick. You know, it's, it's not real. You know? Is there hope to turn this around? Because you called it the vicious cycle. Yes. Is there hope to turn the vicious cycle around? How do we do it? We got to do the work. But are people do? I mean, what are the politicians doing? What are they taking money? <laughs> yeah, they taking money and they not kicking back into the communities. I just posted that the other day. You know, our our leadership are wor more worried about making a dollar than they are saving lives. You know, these people are getting millions of dollars to fix these communities up. Why are they not fixed up? Why are they not? You know, uh, um, centers for these kids to, to go to after school. Why are you not providing organizations? you know, and all these different things for these people, for these young men to do, and these young women. Why they, why, what's going on? Why are y'all getting all this money and not doing nothing with it, but putting it in your pocket? So you, you're being greedy, you know, and as much, as, you know, as, as they putting all this money away for themselves, these people dying, literally, you know. I just the other day, I just seen on the news, uh, two young men were fighting at each other and shot into a daycare. A daycare, luckily they didn't kill anyone, but look, you know, and I feel like the politicians, the leadership, they don't care. They don't care. You know, as long as their family not getting, you know, and, and, and you know, getting hurt or whatever, they don't care. Because if they did, we would be seeing we, more we would see progress. More, we would see way more progress. Mm -hmm. The crime rate in these communities would be down. Mm -hmm. You know, the police, will, you know, will, will be policed, mm -hmm. you know. But that, that, that doesn't happen. Let's talk about Law enforcement. Okay. First off, what are your thoughts about law enforcement? Um, <clears throat> I think you have good cops, <laughs> and I think you have bad cops. Like anything? Yeah, absolutely. I don't dislike, you know, the police. I just think that that there's a level of fear too, in some sense because they're coming from different communities than we come from, you know. No disrespect, they're Cauc most of them are Caucasian. Um, I think that they're fearful of black men and women, obviously, um, because of the stigma that's around our community. The death, they don't, nobody wants to die, you know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to, you know, not make it home to their family. So they're coming out there with that thinking of, listen, we have to protect ourselves. So if you have a cell phone, they will kill you because they thinking it's a gun. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. at the end of the day, it's like, I don't dislike them. I just think that, that they, should, they can handle things differently because killing innocent people is not okay. No matter what color they are, it's not okay. And it's not justified. They killing people and they not going to prison. But you think it's out of fear. I think it's, it's a little bit of both. I think it's fear, and I think it's, um... Is it abuse? Of, of power, yeah, of course, of course. Right, abuse of authority, power. Abu yeah, absolutely, I think that too, you know? I think that, um... And it's not every cop, right? No, no, it's not, it's not every cop, because there there's good cops. I've, I've met a few good cops, but then there's that them bad apples who will, 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 you know, will shoot and don't care. You know? And it's more prevalent in the bigger cities, obviously. Yes, obviously, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, just the other day, they killed a young man, 22, he was 22 years old. He was in his grandmother, you know, his grandparents' backyard, and they will, you know, they, you shoot him, you shoot him down because he had a cell phone. You didn't even take the time to see if he had a gun. What's going on in the communities? What, why are our leaders not speaking up about this? You know, it's and it happens often, and then it goes right under. You know, it goes underground and nobody speaks about it no more. And this happens often. This is not, and some of it don't even make the news, you know? So 
I don't dislike police. I just think they need to get a better handle, better handle on things. You know, I think the police chief and all of these, you know, prominent people need to sit down and say, look, we can't continue to do this. What's going to happen? Eventually, <laughs> because we need law enforcement, we, right? Ab ab absolutely. Absolutely. We just need to handle these situations. Which is way better. Way better. Way better. Because way better. people are dying. People are dying. Yeah. People with kids, too. And that's the discussion we need to have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's... Absolutely. Um, there's solutions to these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you look at cities like New York or mm -hmm. Chicago or Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, it's more prevalent there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Totally agree. Especially, um, like, I, I've lost friends from, that were obviously killed by police, you know, and, F, you know, when you're growing up, it's like, oh, F the police, or, you know, th that saying, and it's like, oh, you know, but as, as you get older, you, you do need the police. Sure. You do need them. But like I said, there's those bad apples who make it so, they make it so bad. Now it's kind of, you're afraid to get pulled over. Mm -hmm. You're afraid, now you're afraid of the police. Mm -hmm. Before, <laughs> you know, the police were, were for you. You know, they will help you and, you know, if you call them for emergencies. Now people are afraid to even call the police. What's, what's going on in our society? We're afraid to even call the cops. Because you might, you, a traffic stop might end, to a, end, end, you know, end up a, a murder. You know, excuse me. You mentioned earlier, uh, incarceration mm -hmm. and we we're going to talk a little bit today about prison life yes <laughs> so uh yeah. tell us about that um it was um it was at a time in my life <sighs> well um, i was incarcerated i spent some years in confinement um I think, I think I had to go through that, you know, <laughs> in a sort of sense, it, it's, it's eerie, but I feel like if I didn't, if I didn't go through these things, then I don't think I would have been here right now with you, you know, so it kind of saved my life in a sense, you know. Because that's hitting rock bottom. Right? Yeah, that was, that's rock bottom. That's rock bottom. And when my mother, this, I'll never forget this. I was talking to my mother on, on, a, on a jail call and she says, um, how you feeling? I says, you know, I'm okay, I'm a little stressed out, obviously, you know, due to the circumstances. And she says, well, I, f I could finally sleep. And that touched me. I said, what you mean? She said, I, I used to lose sleep when you was in the streets, you know? She said, so now I could finally sleep. And I was like, damn, I was mad at first. I was like, now you can sleep, I'm in prison, you know? But as I got older, I realized what she was saying. She was saying that she had a peace of mind, that she wouldn't get a phone call that I, I was dead in the streets or I've, you know, viciously hurt somebody. You know, so at least she knew I was at. That's, that's how she took, you know, I took it. At least she knew I was there and I was safe. Safe. You know. Um, touching. Very touching. And it, it hurt me. It, it hurt me. Um, so, you know, going, going into prison, it was, it was very rough. Many years, it was, it was rough. It was rough. Um, I've watched my daughters grow up, obviously, on visit floors. And I taught my daughter how to tie her shoe on a visit, you know. And these things that I've missed, I missed a lot of things. I've lost a lot of things, but I also gained myself. You know, I found me in this turmoil you somehow. I don't know. <laughs> all praise be to God, but I found me in all of this. And then some people say, oh, it's, you know, there's a stigma about jail. Oh, you, you went to jail and you know, you, you a philosopher. No, I'm not a philosopher because I've known millions of men, <laughs> you know, a whole bunch of men who went to prison, but they didn't have this, the same type of story. They're not sitting here with you, you know, so. Obviously, I took the time to work on myself. I knew, I knew I didn't want to come back to the community the same way I went in. I knew that. I knew I didn't want to be that person who spent the rest of his life in prison. You know, I didn't want to be that person. I've seen dudes in there 70 years old. You know, he, you still coming back and forth to prison? You got grandkids now. When are you going to wake up? You know? So for me, it was sitting down and understanding my thoughts and Understanding what's like, what was, what, was, what was wrong with me, you know, figuring out my, my inner being and finding that power within to say, I'm not going to be this person. I'm going to change my life around. I'm going to come back to society and I'm going to make a difference. You know, so I created Project X while I was there. You know, I got the vision and all these different things. And, you know, it was just like, I cannot be this person no more. I want to be that person, that role model, that leader for my children. You know, they somebody they can look up to because they need to see that. They need to see their father or a man 
because she will measure a man by her father. So she needs to see a man who's out here doing what he's supposed to do, taking care of his family and living in moral and values. She needs to see that, you know? So that touches my heart when I, I can do that, you know? How many years were you there? I was... <laughs> were you in and out? Or? I was in and out okay. for... I was, yeah, I did two stints. I did two, I did two years and I did five. So seven total. Yeah, seven total, yeah. But you're saying that it was really purposeful for you to get you to where, where you are Absolutely. today. I feel like, it sounds crazy, but I feel like God covered me in a sense. And um, he incubated me for a little while. I said, look, <laughs> slow down for a minute. I need you because you're going to do some powerful, great things. So I need, to, need to st I need you to sit down for a little while. At first, I was just like, oh, I'm in no, I'm hurting. I'm crying. <laughs> I'm calling home every minute. My. <laughs> like, but... Now looking back in retrospect, it had to happen. These things had to happen. And I embrace it, I love it. And most people take it like, oh, you know, you've been to prison and you know, they, they, they think it's a, 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 a loss, you know. But for me, it wasn't a loss, it was a gain, you know. So were you on some type of probation after? Yes, parole. And your officer must have been pretty pleased with Yeah who you turned out to yeah, be. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Um, at first it was rough because my record, you know, it's obviously wasn't good. So they judge, they judge you off the record. Okay. You know, until they start to get to, under, to understand you, build a rapport. And the moment that he realized that I, I was different than his whole caseload, <laughs> you know, he, he, he acknowledged that he was like, yo man, I'm, you know, I'm proud of you. You know, continue doing the great work that you're doing. God got you, you know, you're gonna do some powerful things. And I thank him to this day. You know, so it was powerful. It was great, you know, to just to hear, you know, people tell me I inspire them, you know. And and we need to do more of that in society, right? Yeah, when people yeah, do just, good. Yeah, let them absolutely, know. absolutely. Right. They, but they give them more do encouragement. That. Definitely. So, Mike, was there an aha moment that you had where mm -hmm. things just clicked, or was it over time, or you know, you said Project mm -hmm. X? You, yeah. We'll talk about that yeah, in a little bit, yeah, but yeah. what happened? I mean, did you wake up one day and say? What am I doing? <laughs> I got it. Or, or, or was it more, more gradual? Um, for me, it was, it was just like that. One night, it was just, what are you doing? And I woke up. I had this vision, and a project was born. You know, but we get into that in a second. Um, I, um, <clears throat> yeah, it was just one of those moments. It was just like, aha, you arrived, son. <laughs> but um. So tell us what you saw. Tell us what you were feeling. <laughs> well, uh, I, was, I was laying in the bed. I was reading a book. I closed the book for a minute. I was just in my thoughts. And I just went into this trance for a little while. And I call it a spiritual awakening, honestly, you know. And I was just, at that time, I was still trying to find myself. So I wasn't, I wasn't Muslim. I wasn't anything at that time. So as I go into this trance, I, it's like I'm up, but I'm not. I'm in between, so I had this vision of Project X. I seen the name, I seen me speaking to a class, I seen all these different things. It was so powerful. So I, it was, it was so powerful. I got up and I just started jotting. I started writing everything that I seen in my vision. You know, I've seen me giving out quotes and all these different things before I even did it. So I'm fulfilling a purpose. That's bigger. Than, that's even bigger than me. So anything, any friend that I ever had that wasn't with me and like seriously, they were removed. I feel like God removed them because they will, they would be a disservice to me. You know, they would ha they have to go. The people that's with me are the people that's supposed to be here. You know, I didn't see the people, but I've seen the vision. I seen what I was doing. You know, and that's when I said, "Wow, yeah, I got it now. I got I got my my purpose in life." Because I feel like we all need to find that purpose. What are your purpose? It's not to get up every day to go to work. You know, it's not to be a mother or father. You know, what is your purpose in life? And I feel like I'm purpose driven now. So people, they see that. It rubs off and people see it. You know, he got a purpose. That man is fire. He on, he got, he on a mission, you know, so right. stay out of his way. And I love it. You know, I love waking up with a purpose. I've never had a purpose. I used to wake up and just, I ain't want to wake up, <laughs> you know. And now I get up and I'm ready. I'm ready to take on the world. And, you know, I got my wife. There's nothing we can't do, you know. Got my family. There's nothing we can't do. What's more powerful than you besides God? So I, I realized that, that I'm very powerful in a sense. You know. How long ago did this happen? Two years ago. Okay. Two years ago. It's been two years now since I've been on this mission. 
Yeah. So tell us about Project X. That's my baby. <laughs> That's my baby right there. Um, I'm, it's very delicate. I'm taking my time because I'm as I'm growing. Cause I'm still growing. I'm, as I grow, Project X is growing. You know, and it started out as me feeding the homeless, and now it's growing into something else. Now it's growing into me, you know, mentoring other men. You know, and I feel like at the end of it, I want to be an activist for prison. I want to be the voice for people who don't have a voice. I want to be able to sit down with, you know, these politicians and, you know, talk and honestly tell us their side of the story because they need to hear this. You know, these men are going through a lot of issues and mental issues as well, which we, we spoke about, you know, briefly with mental issues and all these different things. And it's going unnoticed, you know, so I want to get eventually get to that level, you know, but as of, it's just growing and as it grows, I want to take these men, these, these, these guys from, you know, incarcerated and I want to merge both of these worlds where we can teach them compassion and love and go into the community and they can put coats on kids backs and show them that you know this you know this there's love still here for you you know they need to see that too you know what does the name mean um <clears throat> it's a play on words the, the x is Malcolm X is somebody who you know transformed my life i you know, a lot of, i always people people know that um so that was kind of like my dedication to him. So, but it's kind of like denouncing what you want, we once were and becoming something different, you know? So like your ex, you know, you're something, you was this and now you're that, you know? So it's the ex. On to the new. On to the new, on to the new. Doing with the old, on to the new, you know? So that's where the play on words came from. But it was also a tribute to Malcolm X too, because he changed my life. His book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley, is one of, also one of the reasons that it gave me hope, too, because Malcolm X spent a lot of time in prison, you know, just like me. He came back into the community and he changed his whole life around, you know. So his story is inspiring. He was in the streets. He had all these different issues. You know, his father was murdered and he gave you that hope that, especially been from our community, that need, you know, they need that, that, that motivation that drive. All right, look, Malcolm X could do it. He taught himself how to read. He taught himself how to write. He had an eighth grade reading level. Now he's sitting on, <laughs> on panels with professors and they can't even understand, you know, his, his vernacular. So it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, that's deep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of books, you mentioned mm -hmm. that you like Dan Brown. Earlier. I love Dan Brown. I love Dan Brown. I love Dan Brown. Um, the reason why I love Dan Brown because he mixes fiction with nonfiction. And it's dope because, especially the Da Vinci Code, I love, I've read that book probably two times. Um, I love thrillers. I love that suspense. You know, Dan Brown is a good, good, great author. He wrote a lot of books. I read most of them. Uh, he, wrote, he came out with a recent, a, a new one. I didn't get a chance to read that one, but I'm very, I'm very avid reader. I read a lot of books. I have a lot of books. <laughs> I should have bought you a couple. <laughs> but one of my favorite is um, James Allen, As a Man Thinketh. Okay. You ever read that? No. Powerful book. Powerful. I'll have it to. said in the book, it says, People are eager to change their circumstances, but they're not willing to change themselves. So we are, e we are eager to change our circumstances, meaning whether you, you, know, you move away, whatever it is that you do, mm -hmm. you can change your circumstances. But what about yourself? Mm -hmm. You're not willing to change yourself. You will change your circumstances way faster than you would change yourself. And that's important, because as a man thinketh, so shall he. And do you think that's pretty representative of, of most people? Absolutely, Yeah. absolutely. I think that's when change happens. Uh, let's go back to your childhood. Okay. Talk about your parents and, and, and your family. What was it like growing up? Um, my childhood was rough. My mom had five kids. Okay. So it's kind of hard to give love individually to five kids and still have to pay the bills. And she did her best, you know, she did her best. Um, <clears throat> My dad was in and out of prison too, so I, I also say it's a generational curse because my brother was in and out of prison too. We all, we all was in and out of prison. And I feel like <clears throat> it's due to the fact that we were exposed to a lot at an early age, you know. Um, both of my parents used drugs. They both, were, they both used crack cocaine. I was with my grandparents until maybe about five or six. I love them to death. Um, they also had an influence on my life, especially my grandfather. He taught me a lot. 
You know, he he was a real man. He was a man's man. He's a man's man. You know, he worked, retired. And we say, Michael, get, you know, go to school, get you a good job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I see Blake Papa, you know, <laughs> I am, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> but to see me go to prison, he cried, you know, because he didn't ever want that for us. He never wanted to see me like that, see me in shackles and, he shed tears, and he only and one. And excuse me, he shed one tear down his eye. And I never forget that he he shed one tear, and I just it just hurt me because I hurt him, and he he wanted the best for us, you know. And um, there's nothing that they wouldn't do. So, <clears throat> like I was saying, my mom she was on drugs or whatever. My pop, my father. So eventually, my mom got herself together. She's been clean over twenty some years, man. Oh, God bless her. She's a beautiful lady. She um, finally got us back, and she was trying to do it on her own, and my father was still battling. But we, like I said, we were being exposed. So what she was teaching us, we would go outside, and the streets would teach us. So we can't, we're getting two different you know, teachings now, two different you know, tutelage. So especially as, a, as, like I said, it's easy for a man to get lost especially when there's no father around. When you right. look into a mirror and you don't see no dad. My dad was doing whatever he was doing, you know, and he, not, not to take nothing from him because he's a great man, but um, he was caught up in his own demons. His father left him, you know, so it's a vicious cycle like we go back again, yeah. you know, and then I'm pretty sure if we go deeper into that, I'm pretty sure his father left him too, you know, so you, we tend to hurt, the, you know, people that we love because we were hurting. He was hurting inside. Now as a grown man, I don't fault him. You know, I don't never want to do that to my kids. Mm. I don't never want to, you know, to, to continue. And, and that's what I tell my little brother. He's doing 10 years right now, you know. And it hurts me that I can't see my brother. I haven't seen him in seven years, you know. And I cry inside because he's such a great man. He's never had an opportunity, really. He was in jail since he was 14 years old, in and out. You know, for what? Trying to prove what? To be with, you know, to be who, you know? And it's like... It hurts me, you know. So when he tell me the other day, I'm his inspiration now, that, that touches me and it means something to me. Yeah. So when I get up and I have a purpose, this is what I'm doing it for. <laughs> I'm doing it for the people who don't have a voice. All of these young men, all of these women who, who feel ostracized by communities, you know, who, who've you know, been exposed into different gang culture and all these different things. And, and they might not be these people, but they just need a way out. You know, or somebody who really cared that's going to sit down with them and explain and go step by step. And how can we do this? How can I help you? You know, everybody always wants something, but nobody want to give. And that's what I want to do. I want to give. I want to help. You know, I want to be that person. Powerful. Mike, tell us about the best day of your life mm -hmm. and the worst day of your life. <sighs> I had a lot of best days in my life. Um, the best day of my life was... um. But one of them was leaving prison. That was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> because I went in and it took so long to come out. <laughs> so when I got, that day came, I remember feeling this, this feeling like, wow, it's over. The last time. That obviously. last time. The yeah. last time. Yeah, the last right. time. That was it. I have not been back since then. It was just like, wow. You know, I was leaving all the guys that knew me. And they, I, I think in, they, in a way they knew that I was going to be something. You felt liberated. They, I felt good. I felt totally different. And they was like, yo, you're going you're gonna to do great, you know, because I was mentoring in there. You know, I was doing all these things that I'm, I was, I'm doing now. So I, but on a, on a small scale, you know, I was just starting to get the hang of everything. So It's a good training ground. Yeah, exactly. You. Exactly. Especially being around all of these men who are broken. Mm -hmm. You know, they were broken, very broken. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I can get through to them, wow, you know. But it make them feel like they, I can change too, you know. So um, walking out of prison was one of the best days of my life. Walking out, seeing my family there, my mom was there. She always there for me. Um, seeing my mom there was like touching, you know, my kids. And I was able to sit down and just relax, you know, no prison guards. And <laughs> you know, I was able to be myself and be free. Um, one of the worst days in my life was... Um, Um, one of the worst days of my life. I think burying my grandmother, mm -hmm. my grandma Nana. She she was a very beautiful lady. I think that was one of the worst days. Um, Cause I wanted her to see what I was gonna become. You know, she seen she died with a with a heavy heart for me. You know, cause I was I wasn't 
living right, you know. So one of the worst feelings is like, man, I wish she was able to see this man that I became. Mm -hmm. You know, she would be so proud, and I hope that she can see me now. And you know, because that was one of the. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I just wish she she could see me. You know, look at this man. Look at this man. I never thought I could. I never thought I could be anything. You know, I never thought that I could reach these levels in my life where people will feel this way about me. You know, to even be on the show, like I said, is is amazing. You know, so it's touching. It's touching to me. You know, so I, I shed a couple of tears. So excuse me. Oh, no. <laughs> it's fine. Um, it's American real here, so yeah. that's yeah, that's okay. Okay. Let's talk about Islam. Mm -hmm. We touched on it earlier. Yeah, yeah. I love Islam. I don't. Here's here's my view, and then yeah. I'd like you to gotcha. respond. Good, good. So to me, religion's a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could be Buddhist. Absolutely. You could be Christian. You could be Muslim. Mm -hmm. You could be Jewish, mm -hmm. and typically it's how we're raised. Yeah. Yep. But for some reason, mm -hmm. there's a huge stigma mm -hmm. around Islam. Absolutely, absolutely. Why? Um, I think part of it has to do with the media, um, and also people being ignorant. People don't really understand Islam. They don't understand what it does for so many people. You know, it's a beautiful religion if people studied it. But I think after 9/11, you know, the media painted it as we are all terrorists, you know. So even when I go to the mosque and I, I wear my thobe and I got my kufi on, and people side, you know, they side eye me, and he's like, they, they make, they, they nervous because they don't know if I'm gonna blow something up, they don't, you know. So, so that's the stigma around it. The stigma is that they don't really understand it. It's kind of like an outcast religion, like you know, most people that are part of Islam are either you know from jail or this is the stigma that they say, you know. I didn't take my shahada in jail, which is you, you know. Muslim, Muslim faith, I declare with Muslim faith. I took it on the streets six months ago, actually, <laughs> you know? So I was just trying to find my, my path in life where I fit in, you know, the society and religion. And, and I started studying Islam. I studied it maybe for two years before I even did it, before I even um, became Muslim. But as I studied it, I was just like, wow, I wish more people would understand it. I wish more people would study this. And they would understand that we don't, we, we're not terrorists. You know, we're not animals and we're, we're, we're human beings. And Islam is beautiful. You know, it's one of the most purest religions. And I feel like the stigma around it, it you know, it does it no justice. You know, people are very afraid of it, especially in society, you know, because they're so used to something, something bad attached to the name. Mm -hmm. But that's what any religion, any religion that you go to, they all were, you know, done things that were, were you know, wasn't, wasn't appropriate, excuse me or hurt people, you know, Christian crusades, we can go through a list of, you know, history. But um, I'm, I just think that more people would, if they studied it, they will love it. So it's really ignorance. It's very, it's very ignorant. It's mm -hmm. very ignorant, you know. Like I said, I mentioned the, the woman earlier who didn't even give me a chance because of my religion. Mm -hmm. You know, what world are we living in that you can't, you know, look past a person's religion? But at the end of the day, we all serve God. And that should be the most important part that God is God. Whether I serve Allah, which means God, <laughs> most people don't understand that. Whether you serve Jesus, God is God, you know? And I think that's the division that society has placed upon us, is that, oh, oh, you, you this and I, we can't get along. You know, we are all, we're all ripped, off rip, we, we are like at each other's throat. And it's like, for what? For what? Because I serve God a different way than you serve him? Right. God is not a Christian. God is not a Muslim. God is not a Buddhist. God is not, it's not none of these things. You know, these are things that were, were put in society. By to, man. Obviously, by man to control, which is understandable. But this is where I find my connection. That doesn't mean that I'm an animal or I'm a terrorist, you know. But Islam is very beautiful, and I love it. And all praise be to God. How come more Islamic leaders aren't speaking out? Or maybe they are, I just, I'm, you know. They do. Okay, they do. good. Yeah, they do. Um, which a good... A good a good, um, Omar Suleiman, I love him. Omar Suleiman, he, re he's, he's, he does a lot of panels with um, Christians and just speaking about Islam. That's important. Very important, very yes. important. I think he's, he's on YouTube. Uh, if you check him out, his name is um, Omar Suleiman. Omar Suleiman. Um, 
<clears throat> he's uh, he does a lot of good work, you know, especially giving that voice to Islam. A lot of people don't really know about. So, what are your thoughts about redemption? My thoughts about redemption. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. It's so, uh, you know, redeeming yourself mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. things that you may have. Mm -hmm. Not just you specifically, but okay. anyone, people that who are trying to redeem themselves, who okay. are trying to better themselves. Okay. Uh, we all make mistakes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just, I'm curious if that's, mm -hmm. do you even think about your, mm -hmm. if you're trying to redeem for some of the, mm -hmm. the, the bad things you did in mm -hmm. life? Mm -hmm. um, and we all deserve a second chance. Absolutely. I totally agree. So is that, is that part of what you talk about with, with, with young kids? Um, that's. Yeah, that's that's one of them. yeah, definitely, definitely, because <clears throat> they feel that because they've done these things that God don't want to hear them, <laughs> you know, or they don't even know where to start. So redemption is very, very important. I feel like there's nothing that we can do that God, is, you know, won't forgive you for, and you can turn away from this. You could denounce, well, you know, what you were and become something way bigger. It's the people who've done it. You know, success stories happens all the time, you know, so you don't have to be this person. And But I feel like fear stops us from being that person, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the fear of, and it's like, oh, well, you know, but God ain't going to forgive me anyway. Or, well, how do you know? How do you know until you try, you know? Yeah. It's important, you know, to repent and ask God to forgive you for your sins. You know, we all sin. We all, we all you know, we're humans. we flesh and blood. We make mistakes, you know. And the more that people understand that, I think, the better off they will be. So sitting down and, you know, understanding redemption is very important. And I always tell these men that, you know, you're not defined by these things. You know, these things that you've done don't defy you. Mm -hmm. What you do now does, you know what I'm saying? That defines you. But what you did in the past is the past, you know? Let it go. Let it go. Let it go and keep going. Yeah. Let it roll. You know? Who's the most influential person in your life? <sighs> Put me on the spot because they, they, <laughs> they gonna watch this. <laughs> um, I want to say, I got a few. Can I name them all? Absolutely. I want to say my mother, number one. I want to say my grandparents, definitely, definitely my grandparents. Um, I want to say my wife. I definitely want to say my brother. My brother is one of them, definitely. His name is Russell. Russell. Yeah, Russell. It's one of my, it's my, it's my heart right there. So you have a, you have a team of influence. Yeah, yeah, I got a team. I got a team. I got a team. And that's important. I got a team, yeah. I, I can't forget my man, my friend, uh, J, um, Big J. That's my man. I can't, <laughs> yeah, he's Big another J. one. <laughs> got to throw him in there. Awesome. Just a few more questions, okay. Mike. Um, what keeps you awake at night? Um... A lot of things. Um, wanting to do more. I feel sometimes I don't sleep. You know, sometimes it's wanting to do more for people, and I have to pace myself. And she tells me all the time, like, "Babe, you know, you need rest." But I feel like my job is not done. I have to do more, 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 and then I kind of forget about taking care of me. You know, and that's important. That's imperative too to take care of yourself. So um, wanting to be a, the better version of myself, that's important. That keeps me up too because my, I always go back into my, my, um, my mind and I say, are, you know, are you doing your best? Are you reaching your full potential? Are you really doing this? You know what I'm saying? So all of that plays a part in what keeps me up. But um, I, I do get rest. Don't get, <laughs> I do get rest sometimes, but just more, you know, wanting to do more for the people when just trying to just become the best version. That's all. Great. Any regrets? Of course. Of course. Um, I regret not being there for my children as I should have been. That's one of my biggest, especially my oldest daughter. Um, and if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> but um, I feel like our relationship it's not the best. It's not the best because I was in prison most of her life, you know, and she doesn't really know me like, like that, you know, so 
now I try to come home and be dad and, you know, you can't do this, you know, so it's like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> you know, so we don't have that, that good relationship as I want, you know, I would, I would want her to come to, be able to come to me and, you know, be that father, that bond, that I don't have that with her, and, I, and that's one of my biggest regrets, and, I, and it saddens me, you know, because I do, I want to be that father figure for her. You know, so I, I know it takes time, though. Yeah. It takes time. And parenting's not easy, is no, it? No, it's definitely not. It's definitely not easy. And um, like I said, prison, <clears throat> it stopped that relationship that I had, you know, with her. She was she she's obviously she's twelve now, so um she's growing. She's at that age in her life where it's very pivotal for her. And I try to catch her before she gets to that side, because I know what's over there. You know, I know I know what you're trying to do. You're not slicker than you know the other people who've done that, you know, so right. don't do that. You're a queen, you're a woman. Conduct yourself like that. I try to, you know, compute all these things into her, but She's at that age where she's never really heard these things, you know? She's never really heard nobody tell her she's a queen and, you know, how much they mean to her. And, you know, not to take away from what her mother taught her, but she's never heard this from a man. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Mm -hmm. It's important to hear it from a man. This especially man. Especially your father. Especially your father. Yeah. Because if you don't hear it from your father, then any little boy can whisper in your ear, and you know what? Before you know what, you're pregnant. And these little boys, you know, and I'm not taking nothing away from them, but... What can, a, what can a boy know about being a father? Right. That's important, you know? So that's one, that's one of my major regrets. I don't regret going to prison. I don't regret it. You know, it, to me, it was, it was something that I had to go through. It saved my life, and I came out on the other end, you know? So I don't regret that. I regret... <clears throat> um, what's another regret I have? I regret um, not doing it sooner. Not being this person sooner, but I also know that nature nature has to it has to work. Right. You know, life has to go and people have to evolve. Mature. And you have to mature. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't really regret that too. So I don't really have much regrets. Cause I look at everything as a game. You know, even if I lost, you can't win without losing, you know. If you think you could just win without losing, then you're just something seriously wrong with you, you know. So I just look at it all as a game. Everything that, you know, trials and tribulations and you know, the hurt and the pain and the tears and, you know, the brokenness and the pain. And it's all part of it. It's all part of this. Yeah. It's all part of the, you know, what made me into the man that I am now. So I thank God for that. I thank God for them sleepless nights. I thank God for hearing those bullets and waking me up. You know, I thank God for seeing, you know, all these different things that I had to, you know, go through in life to get to this place right now. It was all worth it. It was all worth it. It all meant, it all means something now, you know? Before, when I was going through it, it didn't really mean nothing. I didn't understand it. You know, I'm like, going through this pain, what is this pain for? What, what am I feeling? You know, what, what, am I, what am I going through? You know, so it all, it all makes sense now. It all makes sense. Does anything scare you? Of course, a lot of things scare me, but I'm not, I'm not very fearful though. See, there's, there's a difference to me. What scares me is losing my mind, not being able to articulate myself, and these things that I, 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 I'm, a, I'm scared of, you know. I'm scared of not being the best version of myself. I'm scared of, you know, not getting up every day and, you know, being my best. I'm, I, I'm, I'm scared of those things. I don't never want to fall into this comfortability like most people do. I want to stay on, you know, uncomfortable because that's when you grow. I want to stay like that. I like, this is why I'm, I'm here because I said, you know, I've never done this before. I need to feel this uncomfortability because now I'm growing. Right. Wow, I need to feel that. This is, here comes growth, you know? Before I was very shy, I'm very introverted. So when people meet me, they think, man, he's kind of arrogant or something, you know? You know, he just, eh, no, because it's because I'm very shy. You know, I'm very introverted. I keep things in, you know, and I've been going to therapy, but that's, that's another, I don't know if you want to start that now, but. <laughs> we, may, we may leave that for episode two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, and therapy is important. Very, very, yeah. very, very, very important. What's the best advice you ever received? I, uh, <clears throat> best advice I received. I received a lot of good advice. Um, it just the best advice I received was never be afraid to be yourself. 
That was one of them, because I didn't understand it at first. And it took me years to understand it. I'm like, what, what do you mean by that? Never be afraid to be yourself. So what are you trying to say? I'm not being myself. <laughs> but I had to realize I'm putting these walls and barriers up. You see, now we're talking about something totally different. You know, I'm putting all these facades up, all these different things. So I'm not really myself. I'm wearing a mask. So can I peel this mask off and be me? Who are you? If you like to read books, if you like to skate, if you like to play bass, that is you. That is the real you. You know, if whatever it is, you be you, live in your truth, and be honest about who you are. You know, don't never be afraid. And the people that make you feel like you have to be afraid of being you are people that you don't need around you. You know? And I have people like I had people like that around me when I was trying to live my truth, and it was just like, man, get out of here. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're gonna die like here, die here with us, the rest of us. You ain't going nowhere. You're gonna be right here. And it's like, Oh, because they're they afraid and they're scared that you're going to bypass them. And then you know what? One thing I realized when you're walking in your truth, you are a mirror to certain people. People look at you and they realize they're false and they, where they fall short and they say, yeah, I can't measure up to this. So they either don't want to be around you or they're going to talk about you. You know what I'm saying? Or they're going to try to do something that's going to put you in harm's way. So the best thing to do, and that's why I say I feel like I lost so many friends, and especially a lot to the prison system and death, but... I lost a lot of friends also to outgrowing them. Sometimes you outgrow people. You outgrow conversations that people have, and it's frivolous. And that's okay, though, right? That's okay. That's how we elevate. That's how you elevate. But it's not me acting funny. It's just me evolving. In the moment that they evolve and they see, like, oh, wow. I see. I get it now. I see why he couldn't hang out with us no more. I see why he can't sit on, you know, sit on the stoop with us and drink a beer or two. I see why he doesn't do that no more. Not that he's better. He's just grown. He grew up out of it. He's outgrown this situation, you know? Our tagline here is mm -hmm. everyone has a story. Mm -hmm. And playing off of what you just said, okay. um, how important do you think it is for people to come into their own, to live out their dreams, to, 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 you know, to live the things they love mm -hmm. to do and love mm -hmm. to be versus mm -hmm. trying to be someone they're not or mm -hmm. being forced to go in a certain way? Mm -hmm. How important is it to, to live out your story? It's very important. I think it's very important to live your story. Your, sto your story is what will inspire somebody else. So it's important that you live in your story. You know, my story is not done yet, you know? <laughs> thank, thank God, and I pray it does, and it's not, you know? So I think that um, living in your truth, living your story is very important because I hope that somebody watch this and they say, look, I can do the same. And it's his story inspired me. And, and, his, and then, then it, starts a, uh, it starts a domino effect, right, where stories start to inspire other stories and then people, you know, change, changes start to happen in lives. And that's what I want to influence. I want to influence that change, you know, where my story might, a young man might hear my story and say, wow, just like I heard Malcolm X's story, you know. So it started a change in my life. And then my brother's story, and then it goes on and on. So... It's important to live in your story. Be who you are and be the best version of yourself and be true. Be honest. You know, don't, don't never, you know, feel like you have to put on a facade and be fake for people, you know. And if you have to be, like I said earlier, then those type of friends you don't need to have. So. Awesome. If you could go back mm -hmm. and make a phone call to the 20-year-old mm. Mike Pratt, mm. what advice would you give him? <sighs> advice would I give him? I would give him, it's okay to cry. It's okay to embrace your brokenness and heal. It's okay. It's okay to heal. It's okay to, to tell people how you feel. You know, it's okay to it's okay to be who you are. It's okay. Let it go. You know, it's a process. You're going to be great. You're a king. And that's the most important part right there. When you tell somebody that they're a king, it does something to them. And we were never taught to be kings. We were always taught to, you know, to be macho and to pay bills and all of these different things. But then you forget about the inside of a man. And being a king plays a part in that. You know, wearing your crown and wearing it well. Being honest, you know, 
walking in your truth. And I, that's what I feel. I feel like I would tell myself that I was a king. I've never heard that from no man. I seek the guidance of other men through gang coaches, through all these different things. And all I wanted was a father who sat down and taught me and led me through, because a man is a compass for a child. You know, so show me, you know, show me all these trials and tribulations that I have to go through life. Like, I'm doing it by myself and I don't know, I'm crashing into walls and I'm trying to figure out what manhood is all about. What is this, what is this about? You know, and then testosterone kicks in and then one day you just, <laughs> You start to feel something that you've never felt before. I needed somebody to explain that to me. So I would go back and I would tell myself that, you know, you're going you're gonna to be fine. No, don't worry. Go to sleep at night. It's okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to be old. You're going to be fine. You're beautiful. You know, you, you're, you're gorgeous. All these different things that I felt about myself that I never, you know, explored. I had a lot of pain inside of me, a lot of anger and resentment and all these things that I let go today. I let go. You know, so I would definitely tell myself all these things, how much I'm proud of him I am and how much I love him. Nice. And Mike, this has been great. <laughs> what a great conversation. <laughs> I have a feeling you're going to be back. Yeah. <laughs> in popular demand. Definitely. I wish. I pray. I only could pray. We have a I lot got, more I still to talk about. To talk about. <laughs> yeah. But before we let you go, there's one last question okay. that I ask every guest, mm -hmm. and that's what do you want your legacy to be? Wow. Wow. Well, <clears throat> I'm still writing my legacy, but what I want it to be, I want to, um, eventually I'm writing, I'm going to write a book, right? And um, I want my legacy to live on. So if I'm in the ground, you know, for 50, 60, 70 years, my tutelage and my ideologies are still going. People are still being inspired by my story. You know, this is still going on. You know, so I feel like kind of like Malcolm X, he's been there with 50 something years and he's still inspiring people from the grave. That's powerful for me. You know why it's powerful? Because this man inspired me from the grave and I've, I've been, he was dead way before, you know what I'm saying, that I even was born into this world. So to, for that to happen, then you know that's a powerful person and that's a powerful story. And I want that legacy. Not saying that I want to be him, but I want my legacy to keep going. Yeah. Save other people in the process. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. Mike Pride. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so thank much you. for being thank here. You. Thank you. And we're going to stay in touch and we're going to do some good things together. Absolutely. I appreciate it, my brother. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.